Today's teaching is called Wetting Your Sword. As most of you know, Father often uses dreams to bring a message about when I teach. This is the way Father chose to use me for his kingdom. The dreams are not the foundation to the messages. Scripture is. The dreams only serve as further confirmation. And as the saying goes, a picture paints a thousand words. These dreams he has purpose to use as a means to edify you and to bring context in these teachings. They are not the final authority. The word of God is. Dreams convey not only facts, but also emotions. It's either my dreams or someone who has asked me for interpretation of a dream that are often used. The latter is the case with regard to today's message, although I will share a dream that I had a while back in 2022 that is relevant to today's message as well. I always ask permission before I share a dream of someone else. So today we'll be speaking about speaking the truth to one another and the disposition that is required of us when we do. I want to make a request that you send this message to those who need to hear it for the sake of the gospel entrusted to us. The word of God is written as instruction to us, not only for what we face today, but also what we will face in the future, specifically the tribulation. When John the Revelator was given the different letters from Yeshua to give to the different churches, only two were not reprimanded, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Various issues are addressed, but particularly the issue of sound doctrine. These churches will all play out once again, starting from Ephesus right through to Laodicea in the coming tribulation. For more on this, please visit the page on our website titled End Time Foundation. I discuss the seven churches towards the end of the page with an applic applicable diagram of how it will play out. Evidently, in a time of great distress and calamity, people will still go on with their lives and sound doctrine will still be an issue that has to be addressed within the church. How we address it is very important and from the various dreams I've received from people in this week as well as conversations, this is on Father's mind for us to pay attention to. We have those who say that we are not to judge ignorant that Yeshua told us that when we do, we are to judge righteously, just as he always did. In other words, not being guilty of the same sin, and also to not judge by the hearing of the ear or the seeing of the eye as written about him in Isaiah 11. Even further, we are to judge by the spirit and not our emotions, personal opinions, prejudice, and understanding. Even if your understanding is correct, it still has to be subject to the Spirit. This is simply because the Spirit knows where the focus must be. All these must be subject to the Spirit and also guided by the Spirit. This also means that even if you are very close to a person, your relationship with that person does not have preeminence your relationship with Yeshua does. We are all familiar with scripture telling us to speak the truth in love, a scripture often quoted by many. Of course, love is the essential component to truth because how can we say we love someone if we are not willing to speak the truth? It should not only be spoken in love, but the motive has to be love as well. It's not easy to tell someone the truth knowing that it might hurt them or cost us the relationship with that person. It hurts, but we have to be real about this and not make as if it doesn't matter. It does matter. Paul made a statement that is often quoted. This is the familiar scripture in Galatians 2 where he says that he has been crucified and that he no longer lives, but the life that he lives, Christ lives in him and that he lives by the faith of the Son of God. He says that Christ gave his life for him. To quote another scripture by Paul, let's go to Acts 20 from verse 22. He says, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth this in every 
city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says that he is not moved by these things. He's not moved by whatever he may encounter in Jerusalem. What a disposition towards his life and what it truly means to have been crucified. There is no regard for his own life. The life he had in him was the life God was in him. And this brings me back to Paul's statement where he says that Christ gave his life for him in Galatians 2. Christ now lived through him and Paul was truly hidden in Christ with God. He willingly gave his body up to be bound and to be in afflictions so that Christ's life could be made manifest through him and the gospel preached not only through words, but through the manifestation of the cross. The cross is central to the preaching of the gospel. If you remove the cross, you remove the gospel. In fact, the gospel is an offense because of the cross. Before going into the context of this statement of Paul saying that he no longer lived in Galatians 2, I would like to first share a related dream that someone asked me to interpret. This dream was a personal message to this lady, but it is in a worker capacity. I instantly knew that Father would want to use this dream. So here it is. She says, I was coming out of a small cabin in the woods near a big lake. The sun was starting to set and there was fog coming off the top of the lake and the atmosphere seemed dreary. I walked towards the lake and sat on the ground a short distance from the edge of the lake looking out to the horizon. I then leaned back putting my elbows on the ground in a half lying position. I lifted my eyes to the sky and as I looked up I saw the clouds disperse as the handle of something was coming down towards me. I was too busy observing it that by the time I reacted to try and grab it, it was too late and it was retreating back up. I was really upset that I'd missed grabbing it. Lord, I'm so sorry that I missed that, was my first thought as I kept staring up in the sky. I remember I kept apologizing with regret for having missed the opportunity. It wasn't long before I saw the handle coming down again. This time I was ready and grabbed the handle as soon as I could. What I pulled down was a beautiful sword, silver with pink inlay, studded with diamonds on the blade. I was not, it was not your typical sword as it had a curve to it and the edge was not sharp, but I felt it could still do some serious damage. As I was admiring it, I saw the spirit of a woman walking towards me on the water. She stayed over the water but was following the water's edge. As she drew closer to me, I extended my sword towards her and followed her progress with my arm still standing in the same place. As she entered a patch of thick fog, I lost sight of her, but my arm with the sword kept trying to follow her progress. As she came out of the fog, she turned her head to look back as if something had touched her. I felt bad thinking that I'd accidentally touched her while in the thick patch of fog. I apologized to her and asked if she was okay, but it was like she had not heard me and kept walking on. I then looked up to the sky again, and this time I saw a group of heavenly beings. There were several of them, and they'd gathered in a circle to get instructions. I heard one say, the travailing is tonight. This came out very clear and there was something else that I heard very clearly, but for the life of me, I can't remember. They were busy discussing this when one of the younger beings stepped away from the group and speaking to himself as if to commit it to memory. And he said, the travailing is tonight and then move the turnpike. He emphasized 
move the turnpike by holding out his arms in front of him and moving them towards his left as he said the words. I, re think, I remember thinking, what? There's a lot of devastation coming, but I was not afraid because I had been equipped with a sword. Okay, so let's go on to the interpretation. This dream is about father wanting her to understand that there are some issues that he wishes for her to address. Her dream is basically divided into three parts, the lake, the sword and the heavenly beings. I will first address the sword, which was to help give her context with the rest of the dream. The sword is a reference to the authority that is given to her from above, hence why it comes from out of the clouds to her. Not being able to grab the handle in time is to not get a handle on it, which is to say not getting a handle on the authority given to her. It's from above, not below. She mentioned that because she was so busy observing it, she missed the opportunity to grab it. This is exactly his point. She's so busy studying it, being laid back on the grass and admiring it. But what is more important is to appropriate it, grab the handle. Every situation where she needs to use her authority is like that cloud incident. That if she does not cease the moment, she will miss the opportunity to stand in the authority he has given her. The color silver is the color that speaks of righteousness. The pink is a mixture of red and white, where red symbolizes salvation, the blood, and white symbolizes sanctification. The diamonds symbolize difficult times or her own tribulations that she has gone through causing diamonds to come out of the rough. They, in fact, represent the areas of authority she has because she can only rule where she has overcome. The edge of the sword, not being sharp, although strong enough to make an impact, speaks of the fact that she needs to sharpen the sword of the spirit, equipping herself with the word of God. Her sword is smaller, indicating a level of authority. Now about the lake. She walked out of a wooden cabin, the wood a reference to the cross and the cabin speaking of where she has her being in the cross. The first thing she mentioned was that the sun was setting, which in itself is a reference to darkness is coming. The lake itself speaks of masses or multitudes of people and the fog is a reference to the church who is in a fog. The spirit of the woman she saw is exactly that. A spirit. It speaks of the spirit that the church is in, a disposition. The church is in a fog, asleep, with no direction and aimless. They cannot see clearly. The spirit woman is walking over the water along the edge. Walking along the edge is the spirit in which the church is walking by playing it safe. They are walking along the edge, not willing to offend anybody. Not willing to offend the church or to offend the world. She followed the spirit woman's progress with a sword extended, which speaks of judging and discerning her progress. The word of God is the plumb line. This is the authority given to her. The spirit woman remained in this fog and at some point she lost sight of her. This speaks of losing sight of that which needs to be addressed. As workers, we have to keep our eye on the sleeping bride that he is coming back for. Issues have to be addressed. She realized that something touched her. She was somehow unmoved and just goes on as if nothing happened. In other words, she made no impact on her. She started to apologize to her, feeling very bad. This lies at the heart of what Father wants to speak to her about. Just like the spirit woman is not willing to offend the world, so she was not willing to offend her. And because of that, what she has to say has no impact and keeps her in a fog. The heavenly beings and their inner circle speak of being shown that the time is very close for the tribulation to start. 
the word tonight is more a reference to the imminency than an actual tonight. The word night is also a reference to great darkness. The younger angel repeating the words I believe is her angel. He knows how urgent the times are, but there are obstacles, the turnpikes that need to be moved away. In context to this dream being about her heart, the turnpikes are her fear to offend and not getting a handle on the authority given to her. We always have to ask why Father gives us a dream. The call upon her life is to wake up the sleeping church out of her fog, to judge the spirit of slumber and apathy, and to pierce them with the word of God with the authority given to her. She will have to be willing to offend. And if she does not recognize the opportunity at its given time, and does not get a handle on it, she will forfeit that which he intended and called her to do. Her heart is the focus of this dream. Now this dream is for our edification and exhortation. There are many out there who do not have a handle on their authority. They still fear what others will say. Some are willing to offend those they do not know personally, while secretly fearful of those closer to home. Many people hate confrontation. They cannot handle it if someone is angry with them. They cannot bear someone thinking ill of them. Their minds run to and fro with thoughts of what-ifs. They speak in an apolo apologetic way so as to not offend and sugarcoat the truth so that the other person will not get angry. But this is not speaking the truth in love. This is saving your own butt. This is avoiding confrontation in the name of peace. And that peace is a false peace. It stems from insecurity and insecurity has to be addressed each time you experience it. They hug the verse, pursue peace with all men very close to their heart and feel justified when they avoid confrontation. Now this teaching is not about picking a fight with our brothers and sisters. This is much bigger than our little world. When you are in Christ, everything about you has eternal consequences. And not seeing at it as such causes many to not be willing to offend others. Now on the flip side, there are those who cannot wait to pick a fight. They hold dear to their heart scripture that speak about not having anything to do with those who deceive. They pride themselves for not fearing confrontation and at times, like a bull in a china shop, having no care as to the collateral damage. They do more harm than good and have an attitude of let the chips fall where they may. They can appear as very well versed in scripture and sound very convincing and authoritative. However, behind this speaking is a divisive spirit and spiritual pride that stinks up the whole place. They fight a holy war, but alas, God is not in that war. In the end, all of scripture has to be held close to our heart. The issue is not who is wrong or right. The issue is the will of God in a given situation and our sensitivity to his will. So in this regard, let's go back to Galatians 2 and see the context of Paul's statement as to why he felt it necessary to mention that he no longer lives, but has been crucified and that Christ now lives through him. Why did he tell the Galatians this? In this chapter, Paul addresses Peter's unwillingness to offend the Jews. Now, Paul was commissioned to preach the gospel to the uncircumcised which is the Gentiles, whereas Peter was commissioned to preach the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews. And what is that gospel? It is the glorious gospel of grace. Paul addresses this issue in Galatians 2, but not with regard to being under the law versus grace, but rather that in Christ we are all one, because it is only through grace by faith that both Jew and Gentile can be saved. There's only one way, only one door to the Father. Both preach the same message, but 
to a different audience. So let's read that in Galatians 2 from verse 11. Paul says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him face to face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Paul is saying that when James, also commissioned to preach the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews, came, Peter sat gladly with the Gentiles at their table. But when James came with the circumcised, he changed his tune and no longer wanted to sit with them. This grieved Paul greatly for two reasons. Firstly, Paul saw Peter's hypocrisy and what it did to others. This is what the word dissimulation means in the Strong's Concordance. Peter was no small fry. He was one of the pillars of the faith, which is to be a father to others. What he did mattered greatly because it affected many. Paul was not going to let this slide, especially seeing Barnabas, who was given to Paul to accompany him on his missions, being swayed by Peter's actions, amongst others who followed suit. And of course, I'm sure that Paul was grieved by how this also impacted Peter. This needed to be addressed. Playing nice was not an option, because at the heart of what was at stake was not people's opinions, but the gospel of grace. It needs to be said again, what was at stake was not people's opinions, but the gospel of grace. He saw that his actions were contrary to that which he preached, which was grace to Jew and Gentile alike. This was hypocrisy, and this caused Paul to be indignant. Paul considered what was truly at stake in an eternal context, so much so that he did not call Peter aside to address this nicely, but confronted him before them all face to face. Now, many at that moment would have said, this is not speaking the truth in love, right? But Paul was a man no longer alive, and Christ was doing the speaking. Peter's action was the enemy's focus to cause harm to the gospel by dividing that which God intended to unite through grace, which is Jew and Gentile. This is no small thing, because the enemy knew that God intended to unite Jew and Gentile as per prophecy. Pay attention to Paul's fervor about this when he addresses the Gentiles in, of Ephesus in Ephesians 2. He wants them to know that they have been grafted in. Paul understood the eternal purposes of God and was jealous to not only convey these purposes, but to protect them. Just one person can cause so much defilement and division because they are ignorant of what lies in their heart and fearful of how people will react or they are indifferent to the consequences. So much more is at stake in what our lives are about. We are all one body, and if one part of that body becomes a threat to the whole, God desires us to address it, guided by the Spirit. Same is true on a personal level. What happens in your personal life affects the body as a whole. Just one little cell in the body can harm the whole. So let's read Ephesians 2 from verse 12. Paul says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, 
in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who have made both one, and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far, far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Think of the harm Peter's actions would have done to the gospel if Paul did not confront him. Much greater was at stake in this incident and the enemy knew what was hidden in Peter's heart and therefore only needed to set the stage. And of course in Galatians 3 Paul addresses them by calling them foolish because out of this came a desire to turn back to works, that is to say, to want to please God by upholding the law and not by faith. For those who live by the law will be judged by the law. Let's read Galatians 3 from verse 12. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abram might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All of a sudden they wanted to be circumcised. And he had to remind them that Abram was accounted righteous by God before he was circumcised because of faith. And so we are the children of Abram, not by circumcision, but by faith. Thank God for Paul. Thank God for Paul who was willing to offend everybody who has related to this incident, not just Peter. What was at stake? He had to count the cost. That which was at stake was Peter's heart, those who followed him, the fulfillment of prophecy and the gospel of grace. This was no insignificant encounter. And this begs me to ask, do we consider our encounters insignificant or is it just about you and your little world? When you walk by the Spirit, everything has eternal consequences. Paul continues by saying in Galatians 2 from verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He's saying that the life in him is Christ. The moment Paul died to everything, Christ had full control to live through Paul. Paul is not addressing salvation here, but rather Christ giving his life in order to live through us. The Paul, who was a Jew and Pharisee living under the law, was no more. If Paul was a Gentile, he would have made the same point. Which is what? Galatians 3 from verse 28, 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul is making it clear that there is no distinction anymore. Note whom he is comparing to one another, Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. They looked down on them. Women were considered untrustworthy in comparison to men, especially as witnesses, which is why the Lord God used women as the first witnesses to his resurrection, for there is neither male nor female in Christ. Those who were free looked down on those who were bound. He specifically addressed these different groups because the one looked down on the other whilst the other in turn resented them. Pride and resentment were behind these distinctions, which is what Paul was addressing. He was cutting them to the heart. Behind deception lies not only an inadequate understanding of Scripture, but also a heart given over to pride or bitterness. Not only for those who deceive, but also those who are being deceived. This does not mean the person does not love the Lord. Rather, if anything, Paul wanted to prevent Peter from losing sight of the grace of God, which in the end could have led it to be a salvation issue, not just for Peter, but for those who followed him. Poor Peter as always, being caught not getting the essential issue at hand, did not realize he once again stood in opposition to the gospel of grace, just as was the case when he stood in opposition to Christ not wanting him to go up to Jerusalem and to be crucified. I had a short dream on Friday. At that point, I was just starting this devotional, but it further illustrates the point. This is the dream. There was a mouse in my house. I saw how this mouse wiggled its way out from beneath a door. Obviously, I wanted to catch this mouse. This mouse represents a pest. My daughter threw a mouse trap in front of the mouse and it just ran over it and got away. I looked at the mouse trap and saw it had no cheese. I then said to her, This mouse trap means absolutely nothing without the cheese in it. In other words, no matter what you throw at it, if it does not have that which is necessary to catch the mouse, you will have no impact on it. The next moment, I saw tiny mice running all over the place. They were so small in my dream about the size of fleas. So this dream father gave to illustrate that the house of God is so easily infiltrated by pests. A pest spreads and causes sickness and defiles. It usually goes after the food, and food represents doctrine. A mouse is a very small animal that can wreak havoc. It may look cute and cuddly, but make no mistake, it's there to take over. Once again, what lies behind being swayed by wrong doctrine is a matter of the heart and not having a clear understanding of the Word of God. And if you do not catch it in time, it will spread and defile many, causing many to go astray. What does the cheese represent? The cheese represents pure doctrine, that which is wholesome. The mousetrap itself is to use pure doctrine in order to have an impact, which often will cause a wound. Think of the devastation of a mouse caught in a trap. Remember, this mouse represents false doctrine that spreads and is an enemy to the house of God. It has to be killed. Speaking the truth in love will always offend, depending on where the other person is in their walk with God. This love is not mushy. This kind of love at times calls a spade a spade, or as my mom says, calls a spade a shuffle. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. At the time of preparing this message on Saturday morning, I went inside my lounge, finding my cat crouching down to see what is beneath our couch. Immediately I thought, what did the cat drag in? Together with Kitty, I crouched next to her and saw a very small frog that she obviously wanted to play with. 
froggy did not stay long. However, father was confirming his point again. A frog is symbolic of an unclean spirit. And if we do not deal with doctrinal error, hypocrisy and issues of the heart, it will defile the house of God. Not just the house of God, but your own house. Paul, contrary to what others present during this confrontation may have thought, was indeed speaking the truth in love. Scripture tells us clearly in, in Ecclesiastes 3 that there is a time to embrace and a time to not embrace, a time for war and a time for peace, a time to rent and a time to sow. The question therefore is, what is the situation requiring? And in each situation, we will speak out of the abundance of the heart. Therefore, it is vitally important that we deal with the issues of the heart because they function as a filter through which we speak. You may speak the absolute truth, but within your heart may be resentment, indifference, lack of mercy, and even revenge. As much as the false doctrine is a defilement, so too your heart when you speak out of the abundance of such rotten fruit mentioned. It is a defilement unto others who hear or read what you write. You may get to say what you thought to be right, but in the end, where you thought you stopped defilement, you in fact only continued with it. Others hear or read what you wrote, and the spirit of the speaking affects those who listen. There is an inception that takes place, seeds sown into the hearts of men. And as the saying goes, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Sometimes situations require us to speak in a loving tone. And at other times, we have to speak very directly and even cause a wound. Paul stated that he no longer lived, but Christ lived in him. If Paul then died, who was doing the judgment? If Yeshua said that he only spoke what he heard his father speak, then who did the judging when he called the Pharisees vipers? This does not give us carte blanche to say what we want and then say it is God speaking. The requirement to be able to say this is to no longer live. A certain disposition is required of us, which is the same as that which Yeshua walked in when he said that we are to judge righteously. Prophesying about Yeshua, Isaiah said in Isaiah 11, from verse 2 and 3, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So I want to share a dream I had in 2022. It was followed by a short vision when I woke up. This dream has at its foundation what is needed in order to bind and loose. We say that we have been given authority, but authority is earned and has to be sustained by a character that will not abuse it. This can only be if we walk in authenticity and in truth. Not everybody has the same authority in scripture. The fivefold ministry being apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists and pastors are shepherding functions, which means they are overseers of the flock. They are held accountable for the state of the church in the designated sphere given to them. This has nothing, I repeat, nothing to do with their value. It's merely a position and delegated authority that carries with it great responsibility and accountability. And unfortunately, many look upon these and think God values them more. They may not necessarily confess to this, but secretly cover their position or office because they feel that this is a sign of God's approval and being chosen. But the truth is, we're all servants. He did not die for one more than the other. He chooses whom he will choose, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the person, him or herself. God is sovereign. Note, not all are apostles, 
prophets, teachers, evangelists or pastors in the capacity of an office. There is the office, which is a position. This is delegated by God. Then there is the works of apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists and pastors. This means you are not in the office, but being sent is to be apostolic. The church itself is an apostolic and prophetic entity. To prophesy does not make you a prophet. You are acting in the gift of prophecy. To teach, evangelize or pastor someone is not necessarily the office. It is the function. Many teach others, prophesy, evangelize and pastor, that is to say guide or mentor someone, but they are not in that office necessarily. It is God who appoints and promotes. There is much confusion in the church about this and has caused many to take offense, not willing to submit to delegated God-given authority, taking up an office they have never been called to. And of course, authority being used to manipulate and control the flock, as many, uh, as also as many false prophets out there, has not helped at all with regard to godly submission. So coming back to the dream, remember that it does not matter whether you are in the office or not. What matters is your heart. Okay, so here's the dream. I was walking down a hallway of a much neglected building. I passed a door where I could hear people screaming at each other. It was clear to me that the people living in these apartments were very poor. Suddenly, I found myself inside one of these apartments. A very big man, bald, unwashed and filthy, hairy and wearing a white vest, was standing before a little girl. She was seated on the wooden floor. She had a white dress on and the dress was full of dust. He roughly picked her up and walked out the door. I followed them and saw that he put her down. Instinctively, she followed him as he walked into another room. I knew that once she entered, she would be abused. Just as he entered, she quickly closed the door behind him and locked it. I then saw her running downstairs with a teddy tucked under her arm. When I woke up from this dream, I asked Father what the dream was about, and he said, even a little girl can bind a strong man. I then woke up and saw a vision of a bloody sword and clearly heard in my spirit, it is time to wet your sword. To wet your sword means to sharpen your sword. You will remember in the first dream, the lady said that her sword was blunt on the one side. And sword here means authority. It means the word of God and it also means to speak. We also say that someone has a sharp tongue. Scripture also further confirms this. David cries in Psalm 64 from verse 2. He says, hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Note, it's bitter words. They wet their tongue like a sword. This wet is the wetting of a sword, which means to sharpen it. Words cut. Now God also wets his sword. That's in Psalm 7, verse 11. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. When he told me at that time to wet my sword, it was to say it's time to address issues within the church. Now, is your sword blunt because of insecurity and the fear of man? Or is it blunt because of bitterness and spiritual pride? What is the true state of your sword? The lady said in her dream that she knew her sword could still do great damage. It either does damage to the kingdom of God or to the kingdom of the enemy. Now let's come back to the interpretation of the dream about the little girl. The strong man represents fear. This is the whole setting of this dream, which is this little girl against this Goliath of a man. She's in stark contrast to him in her size and in her innocence. She is innocent of sin and her clothes that are full of dust represent a humble heart. The teddy bear represents the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. She never goes without her comforter. 
Binding the strong man in this case is to deal with the fear of man. Just as Yeshua said that they will bring us before magistrates and courts and that we need not worry what we speak, but at that moment the Comforter will give us utterance and remind us of everything he said. We read about the strong man that has to be bound in a house first in Luke 11. This is where they accused Yeshua of casting out devils in the name of Beelzebub. So let's read Luke 11 from verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if by Beelzebub, cast out devils by whom do your sons cast them out therefore shall they be your judges but if i with the finger of god cast out devils no doubt the kingdom of god is come upon you when a strong man armed keepeth his palace his goods are in peace but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none he saith i will return unto my house whence i came out and when he cometh he findeth it swept and garnished then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Three things are addressed in this parable, which is a kingdom, a house, and a man. All three are therefore connected. This word kingdom is the word basileia, which speaks of delegated royal authority. It therefore points to kingdom authority. The word house is the word oikos, which means a home, a tabernacle, a tent, etc. Basically a dwelling place. It means the household of God or church. In this scripture, the kingdom is brought to desolation, which means to be stripped of treasure or to be despoiled, referring to authority given. The church, on the other hand, falls, the house falls. And falleth here means to go from a higher place to a lower place. Metaphorically, it speaks of falling under judgment or to come under condemnation. And then lastly, the man's state is worse than what it was in the beginning. This has all to do with compromise and being divided. In other words, this division in the kingdom and in the house of God, whether the church or at home, causes the authority to be stripped and the house of God to be judged. I have to say that again. This division in the kingdom and in the house of God, whether the church or at home, causes the authority to be stripped and the house of God to be judged. No small thing at all. I'm reminded by the spirit of this kind of destruction that I've seen over the course of many years regarding a particular church. Because the pastor did not address issues within his own household, his children served within the church in leadership positions. And their worship and service may have come from a sincere heart. However, all of them, with the exception of one, had secret sin that has been exposed through the years that is called immeasurable pain, suffering, division and judgment on this church. And the suffering and shame the pastor and his wife now have to endure because of this cannot be explained in words. I believe a hundred percent that this is a judgment that came on this church and those who suffered 
of those who looked up to them. Great harm was done to the kingdom because of the unwillingness to offend and to take responsibility as the word requires. How many people that are worshippers in front of a congregation have secret sin hidden in their hearts and believe that this does not defile his church? How many elders are divorced not on biblical terms and do not have control over their own households? How many of the leaders of the youth groups are friends rather than fathers or mothers to the children? How many in the church covet money, status, position, adoration and those in leadership who should address it keep quiet for the sake of peace and not wanting to upset the apple cart? Think of Hophni and Phineas. They ate of the sacrifice meant for the high priest, their father, Eli. In the end, Eli fell over and died, being quite overweight himself. And what was the result? Ichabod, the glory has departed. Remember, to keep Galatians 2, where Paul confronted Peter in consideration when we discuss Luke 11 shortly. Yeshua then makes it clear that because of this principle regarding division, the mere fact that he is casting out devils shows that he is not doing it in the name of Beelzebub. He mentions pointing the finger and casting out devils. This pointing with the finger means to judge, as was the case with Nebuchadnezzar, that saw the finger writing on the wall that had the message that he was weighed and found to be too light. Also, when Yeshua wrote in the dust with his finger, when the Pharisees accused the woman caught in adultery, was a judgment on them. Whilst they were judging her, he was judging them. That's a reference to Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. In Luke 11, there are two strong men, the original strong man and the stronger man. Yeshua is the stronger man, casting out the devil. Remember, Yeshua came to this earth as the heavenly Joshua to take it back and establish his kingdom here. This is why he said that when he points with the finger in judgment, the kingdom of God has come into their midst. The original strong man who occupied the house is said to be an unclean spirit, just like the strong man in my dream that was filthy or the frog that came into my house. Unclean is anything that defiles, whether it is doctrine or a disposition of the heart. Please understand that the context of this parable Yeshua is telling them is that of division within the church and within authority. Yeshua then says that those who are not with him are against him, and those who do not gather with him scatter. He is saying that this division within the church shows those who are against him, and the fruit will be twofold. They will scatter the flock, and they will bring seven more unclean spirits with them. The number seven here means completion, not the actual number seven, but rather what it represents. It means that the defilement will ultimately take over. Remember the little mouse in my house in the dream and all the baby mice? It's not the person judging this defilement that is the one bringing division, but rather he is addressing the division that already is within the church just as Paul did. God will hold those who are overseeing the flock responsible for the defilement within the church. God will hold those responsible as heads of their homes responsible for the defilement in their homes. I'm sure there were those who looked upon Paul as a real stirrer and one who disturbs the peace and unity and that he was bringing division. But the Spirit of God was indignant in Paul against this division that was in direct opposition to the gospel of grace, dividing that which God wants to unite, Jew and Gentile. And this division later caused the pure doctrine of grace to be defiled and scattered the flock. The entrance of this division, and by extension defilement, was through Peter's heart, who did not want to offend. What does that tell us about Paul's heart then? 
Could he speak with such authority if his heart had resentment in it or the fear of man? The word clearly says, be angry, but do not sin. Continuing with Luke 11, the enemy finds entrance into this house by the fact that it is cleaned and nobody is there to kick him out. It's empty. Why is this house empty? Should it not have the stronger man now in this house after the evil spirit has been kicked out? This house represents the church and then of course we are the temple or house of the Holy Spirit and therefore it represents individuals as well. He says that this house is a man saying this last state of that man is worse than the first. That man was divided within himself and caused others to go astray. Note the unclean spirit says I will return to my house. He still owns this person, meaning this person is still in bondage to it. He did not repent. The issue was addressed. He was exposed and reprimanded, but he did not repent. And that gave access to the seven more wicked spirits to come in. What a cost for our silence or spiritual pride. In my own life, I've encountered this. Someone that used to be very close to me became involved in deception he came to me and accused me of being a false teacher and condemned me to hell. Much more was said, but Father prepared and warned me in advance by giving me three dreams and a word to keep quiet and say absolutely nothing when being accused. I was determined to pass this test. And just after this person spoke to me, the Lord gave me a vision. I saw a pocket watch fall to the ground and the inside scattering on the floor. Immediately the word of the Lord came to me saying that unless he repents and, re and turns to the pure word of God, like this pocket watch, God will humble him and cause him to fall to the ground and the purposes of God for him will be broken. Would God have been able to use Peter if he continued to act in opposition to the very gospel he was called to preach? Now this word I was to give him who spoke these things to me. I did this knowing that at that moment my family, friends could very well turn against me and that I would lose this person whom I love dearly. I was obedient and since then he has left his church, joined a cult and many others were swayed by him to join, leaving a very dear pastor devastated as his church was robbed. The subtlety of this cult is not easily noticed. I made it very clear to him that he is deceived and in a cult. By the pastor of this church's own admission, he saw the deception and never dealt with it in his church. Maybe there is a pastor listening to this message, or maybe you've been tiptoeing around issues that need to be addressed. Please consider the cost and the damage if you do not address these issues. My words to him were that unless he repents, he is not welcome to come to my house. My door, however, is open to him, should he repent. I was tested in this regard again. He came back to me a year after this incident and wanted to come and visit. And this without having yet addressed the issue at hand. He thought for the sake of peace that we could sit around the table and enjoy each other's company. After all, we both love the Lord. I never questioned his love for the Lord. However, not dealing with the deception and bitterness was not going to fly by me. I addressed this and said, how can two walk together unless they agree? I was not going to make it as if I'm okay with him when I'm not. I said this in a loving but firm way because I really do love him. And once again reminded him that once he repents and returns to the pure doctrine of the word of God, he's welcome. Please understand that what he believes is twisting scripture and the fruit of robbing a pastor of his flock. The bitterness speaks of being utterly deceived whilst thinking is in the truth. When I sought father on this matter whether I should allow him in my house again, he gave me a scripture clearly telling me that I was not to allow him in my house. That's in Proverbs 23 from verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that have an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up, and lose thy sweet words. 
Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. This scripture has two warnings. One is to not sit at the same table, and the other is that if I do, I myself will lose my sweet words. I will be defiled. If I was to defile myself, and by extension my sweet words, the wisdom that Father gives me, how would that affect the teachings I make? How would that affect those who listen to me? This is a very sobering, th sobering thought. But I felt sorry for him and thought, let's make peace. Guided by my emotions and affections towards him, then would I've, I would have been defiled. We are not to cast our pulls before the swine. He determines when that time comes of cutting off, not us. In the past two days, I saw two shorts on YouTube about huge hailstorms. Very scary to say the least. The next day, I woke up at 4.17 and in the Strong's Concordance, it's a word that means huge hail. Interestingly, it also says as in huge poles. What was Father saying to me? He was saying, the judgment on this world through hail is the judgment of distorting and ignoring the poles of the gospel on those who trampled it underfoot. That very word they defiled or ignored will reign as a judgment on them. In other words, this is not just about ignoring the word of God, but also abusing or twisting the word of God, the gospel that is as a pull. God is not playing games. Those very pulls will come back as judgment in the form of hail. God will stone the nations and they will be much larger in the time to come. Now coming back to Father saying to me that even a little child can bind a strong man the point was not the fact that it's a child, but rather that of purity. Purity of heart is the issue here when addressing that which needs to be addressed, whether in our homes or church. The two pastors I quickly referred to had issues in their own hearts that caused them not to deal with the issues in the church. They were not innocent as a child. This is the requirement asked of us when it comes to addressing issues that are very difficult and have great consequences. We have to be without guile, which is to say without ulterior motives. If we do not, we will tiptoe around them, ignore them, procrastinate or think of excuses using scripture. There can be no ulterior motive. The sword first has to cut your heart before it can be used to cut the hearts of men. Stephen was such a man who, although a mere servant helping the widows and poor, was as one without guile. For the pure in heart shall see God, and so he did. Whilst being stoned, he saw the heavens open up and Yeshua standing at the right hand of God. This was right after he withstood his accusers face to face and not sugarcoating it at all. Just as there is a great price to stand up for pure doctrine and address the issues of people's hearts, so there is an even greater reward. However, the one that will be sacrificed is you. You have to die to the fear of man, die to your loved ones, friends, family and ambitions. You have to be willing to give up your life. Yeshua told Peter in Matthew 16 that he gives him the keys of the kingdom. Now we always need to read scripture in context. What is the context of Matthew 16 and Peter being given the keys of the kingdom? Yeshua told them to be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They first thought that he was talking about the fact that they did not bring bread for the journey. He had to then remind them of the previous miracles we provided for the thousands. The context was doctrine. Now, from an eschatological viewpoint, this scripture refers to the 144,000. The book of Matthew was written for the Jews. So, this refers to the last part of the tribulation, Jacob's trouble. The book of Luke is written for the bride of Christ and the book of Mark written for the Left Behind Church. 
This is why regarding this same account of Peter being given keys that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, we only find in Matthew keys given to him and not in the other synoptic gospels. It starts off by saying that they were in Philippi, a reference to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3. The 144,000 were given an open door that nobody can shut. This door being open is a reference to many things, but in the context of Matthew 16, it represents authority given with regard to the gospel. We need keys to open doors, and Peter is given these keys. He represents in Matthew 16 the 144,000 in this context. This is during the trumpet spirit of the tribulation. Now remember, the little girl in my dream is given authority to bind or loose, which means in the strongs to open or close a door. She is without guile. Let's quickly read that in Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia are the evangelists. They represent the two fishes amongst the five loaves of bread feeding the multitudes. Let's remember what we are talking about in this teaching. We are talking about pure doctrine, the gospel and authority. This is represented by a sword, a door and a key. All three hold hands. The door in this context of our speaking that is open to the Church of Philadelphia is the Gospel. And this Gospel is that God sent His only begotten Son to die for this world, so that whosoever believes on Him shall be saved. That it is His intention that no man should perish, but that all should come to salvation. He is that door, the way. However, he is saying to Peter that the gates of hell will not be able to prevent this gospel to be preached and that the church will be built upon this glorious gospel of Christ. This door that God opens, no man can shut, and when he shuts it, no man can open it. The key is given that of authority with regard to this door. He was saying to Peter, I give you the authority to preach this gospel all over this world. This Peter did immediately after the outpouring of the Spirit when he preached the gospel with great boldness and authority to those on the outside. Many asked, what must we do to be saved? And whatsoever is bound in heaven, whatsoever door is closed, will be bound on earth. Whatsoever door is open in heaven, you will open on earth. He was not talking about binding strong men or demons in Matthew 16. He was talking about the gospel. Always read scripture in context. And granted, there are some areas where the door is not open to speak the gospel. In Acts 16, an angel appeared unto Paul directing him to preach the gospel in Macedonia. He was not going to Macedonia originally, but out of that mission, he met up with Lydia, a seller of purple. History has proven that Lydia was responsible for the gospel being preached in Europe. So I've had instances where the Spirit told me not to pray for people and that the door was closed. We are told that to those who refuse the gospel, we are to dust our shoes off, at the same time declaring that the kingdom of God has come in their midst. To further confirm that this door represents the gospel, let's read some scriptures pointing to this. Colossians 4.3 With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. 2 Corinthians 2.12 
Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16.9 For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. The one thing that the Church of Smyrna and Philadelphia have in common, apart from being the fishermen of the gospel, is that they are willing to lay their lives down. That means when it comes to the purity of the gospel, when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, and when it comes to the defending of the gospel, they are willing to forsake all, brother, father, mother, sister, friend, and even themselves. This does not come overnight. As seen with the case of Peter in Galatians 2, who feared the Jews, that which is in his heart caused great harm to the Galatians. And we have to be truthful about why we are not willing to offend people. The same is to be asked, why are some so willing to offend people again? Whatever is still undealt with in your heart will ultimately defile. If you cannot speak the truth to your brother or sister, if you cannot speak the truth to your husband or friend, how will you do it when they are ready to stone you? If you're not willing to lose your life now, how will you lose it then? You have to be willing to lose them forever. You are still holding on to that life in you that needs their approval and that cannot stand confrontation. At what cost are you being quiet when he calls you to speak? You may not necessarily see the damage or defilement immediately, but it grows as a weed and will take over. My mentor Arthur Katz used to say that in that moment when deception is not addressed, there is a slow erosion of truth that takes place in your own heart so that the next compromise comes easier and will grow. He also said the following about deception and refers to the subtlety of deception not easily detected. He says there is an unspoken covenant between deceiver and deceived that allows the pretense to go on. There is no preacher who allows himself to become a performer without a congregation willing to become an audience. There is a self-serving end for both. The flatterer and the flattered, the seducer and the seduced have both ceased to love the truth for the same self-gratifying reasons. This is why I say that deception is a matter of the heart and not just doctrine, both for those who deceive and for those being deceived. In other words, your unwillingness to address it defiles you too. Even if you do not agree, ultimately the compromise defiles you in your silence. There are some who are willing to speak the truth, but not the whole truth. Or in other words, you are willing to tell someone they are walking in error, but instead of grabbing them by the arm as a branch plucked out of the fire in order to save them, you gently coax them out of it. And in truth, rather than saving them from destruction, you're saving yourself. In order to speak the whole truth, you must love the truth. That means that you are zealous first and foremost to walk in the truth before you judge others. What God desires of us is to allow the word of God to shine through a clear prism that is not defiled by selfish emotions, spiritual ambition, unaddressed issues and our human understanding and insecurities. He seeks those without guile to be as his mouthpiece in the time to come who will give the word of God unfiltered and unadulterated to a people and a church who walk along the edges in the fog of slumber, apathy and compromise, unaware that it leads to their own destruction. It is time to wet our soul. The blade is only as sharp as your guilelessness. Truth does not only affect your speech, but everything about you. If you walk in the spirit of truth, truth will manifest itself by how you dress, by how you spend your time, as well as your overall hearing and seeing. Everything about you will speak of authenticity so that truth will be communicated without you even speaking a word, because this is where you have your being. There will even be a jealousy for words and their true meaning simply because you love him who is the word. Words like awesome, amazing, apostolic, prophetic, 
righteousness, glory, and the like are used glibly in conversations without us being apprehended by the heft of the weight of these words. We are to contend for all that which constitutes truth. Using these words glibly constitute the abuse of them. We are called to be other than, set apart, holy and authentic in what we say or do. Art further states, the end never justifies the means, the end dictates the means. If the end is the revelation of God who is the truth, then the means must be truth in every aspect of my life. Fear is going to be the number one enemy in the time to come. We will be persecuted, cast into prison and have no food at times. We will be exposed to war, pestilence and signs in the heavens. Fear will be so thick amongst the world that they will hold on to anything that will give them a sense of security, even if it is a false security. Fear of man will be great and the kingdom of God will suffer because of this. However, the gates of hell will not prevail against the gospel of God to be preached. If anything, tribulation is that which causes the gospel to spread like fire. However, tribulation will cause many to compromise as well. Many times through the writing of this teaching, the spirit would come over me and I would start to cry. At one point, I realized that it was not me crying. I asked, Lord, why are you crying? Why are you so sad? And he said, my children do not realize what is at stake when they are not willing to speak at a given moment. That moment may never come again and eternity is affected by either their obedience or disobedience. I died for this gospel of grace, which is to be jealously protected. I paid with my own blood for this gospel, but they are not willing to lose their life. They are willing to offend me, but not them. I believe Yeshua is deeply saddened by how we are not willing to offend and at the same time how others hurt one another in the name of truth. In the end, what matters is that he has something to say and he uses our mouths to say it. And when we silence his voice, it will cause much defilement within the house of God. You will see this defilement in many forms and not just in deception. Humility is not always keeping quiet. Humility is humbling yourself to whatever the spirit subjects you to, even if it means that you need to wound a friend or family member. Sometimes he does call for silence. But the key is to have a pure heart that can discern when that is. If we fear man, we will compromise. This brings us to the function of those of the fivefold ministry who are responsible to address these issues, not only now within the church, but in the time to come. At this present time, we are without any doubt in the church age of Laodicea, known for her lukewarmness. The reason Yeshua addressed lukewarmness is that during that time, they had to create water pipes to ensure that Laodicea had water. And by the time the water reached the city, it was already lukewarm. And this is a reference to mixture. At this present time, the church could not be more compromised as it is now. What is allowed in the church and sanctioned in the name of grace is merely using grace as a means to sin. To speak against things is somehow allowed by the world, but not the church. She is to shut up and know her place. And if she does not comply, she will be persecuted. As mentioned before, all of the churches will play out again. And so after the church of Laodicea, the tribulation will start with the church of Ephesus, known as the apostolic age of the church. He will send out those given authority over his church to address these very issues. And hence the promise of persecution to follow. This is why he is addressing this issue today. 
as workers we will not only be responsible to preach the gospel but also to preserve the gospel and it starts now with what is in our hearts because just like peter whatever was unaddressed in his heart specifically the fear of man is what the enemy will use against the gospel as yeshua said you are either for me or against me either you gather or you scatter what is at stake with what you still need to deal with in your heart is more than just your immediate world but rather the gospel of christ which the enemy wants to stop at all costs as art Katz says in his book the spirit of truth paul knew what every lover of truth knows in order to speak truth you must demonstrate truth and in order to demonstrate truth you must be as humble and transparent as the spirit of truth himself. It's time to wet our swords. I end this message with a word Father gave me in 2021. Take up your authority. Take up your authority, the authority I've given you. As my conduit, you shall rule and reign through me and unto me. Only you must place your feet wherever I direct you. And the placing of your feet, even as mine was, is the statement of annexation. Taking back. Taking back all that I've given you, but also that where you place your feet. The just shall live by faith. Do not fear the enemy. The enemy fears me in you. Therefore stand. Stand in the midst of all and declare the victory of the cross. As the captain of hosts, I will go with you. As the captain of hosts, I will command. As the captain of hosts, I have laid my life down. Even so, do not fear because of my death. You have life. Resurrection life. Life from above they are from below but you are from above heaven my kingdom has come down when you take your god-given authority and point with the finger of god devils will flee at the noise of the waters of my voice they tremble at my voice so speak that which i give you to speak be bold and courageous because i go before you and because i go before you your enemies will scatter Take up your authority and declare my kingdom come. The kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Watch your enemies flee at the sound of my voice. Watch your enemies fall in my presence. Remain in me. Abide under my shadow. As I said, a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come near you nor thy dwelling place for i am your dwelling place no weapon formed against you shall prosper not one only believe that this is your inheritance therefore do not be of a feeble mind but take up your authority and reign amen